Board of Education meeting in order, please. Join me with the flight fleet. Tonight we've asked uh, Kenneth Henderson and Horst to be represented, and I think Linda the Barber and Jared Stoffel are in the audience, so if you come forward, Linda and Jared. Um, KAMSA exists to support middle school administrators as their leadership responsibilities are shaped by the unique needs of early adolescent children. It also exists to help administrators translate accepted middle level theory into practices which accurately and reasonably reflect the theory's principles. CAMS is closely affiliated with the Kansas Association for Middle Level Education and upholds the concept that all middle level educators must work together in advocating changes that better serve the needs of early adolescent children. It is the professional organization in Kansas for middle school administration. Um, it's an affiliate of the United School Administrators in the state, and we're pleased to uh, work with that group. As a matter of fact, I think Mr. Stoffel is a member of their board of directors this year and maybe it was last year as well. Um, tonight we have the distinct honor that um, both of our middle schools have been selected as exemplary middle schools by the CAMSA organization. Um, there are 17 other middle school, or 17 total middle schools in the district in the state that have received that honor, and that's out of 258 middle schools in the state of Kansas. So it's a uh, Fantastic honor for our schools, and I'm going to ask uh, Glenda and then Jared to, to take a minute and, and uh, share a little bit, maybe introduce the staff that they have here present tonight. Well, I think this is pretty exciting that this is during um, Education Week that we get this recognition, and um, primarily because it's the teachers that do all of the hard work. And I have let me hear three or four of you here. I think you want to stand up. Just to Brenda, Lindley, and Susan are, are here from uh, Kenneth Henderson, and uh, we have a choir concert going on tonight and a track meet going on tonight, and I'll put in a little plug if you want the, the latest and greatest of the track scores, please check tr tracks out on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> they're on there. Uh, so we're busy and we're, we're trying to make the best things we can happen for the kids, and uh, these folks have, have helped do that. We're real proud of them. And then we do have a couple staff members here for Horse Good. I'd like to stand up as well. Susan McCown and Carla Carter. <laughs> we made Susan come just so she went to both schools. <laughs> but like Linda said, this is a, a recognition for all the hard work and effort that our staff and students put forth this past year. And on behalf of Forest Kids, we'd like to thank you for recognizing us tonight. So thank you. Thank you. I might add one other thing. Susan, how many years have you been teaching? What, all together? Uh -huh. This is my 47th year. What did you start? Were you five? <laughs> <laughs> Susan will be retiring this year, so we'll get to recognize her at our luncheon for staff members as well. But that's pretty amazing accomplishment. Awesome. Any questions? It's tremendous. We are as a board, we're thrilled that what y'all have accomplished and for y'all to receive this recognition 
for your accomplishments and for the accomplishments of your staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. here to be recognized at uh, Lafayella. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it is a, an honor for me to be here. Um, and today we are here to present a presentation that we presented a few, actually maybe a month, less than a month ago. Uh, where we were able to, or where we were selected to be a part of the 22nd uh, Model School Conference. And so I brought four teachers. These are not the four that presented at that time, but Carrie Stillman was one of them who presented. Nate Edson, he's a new teacher this year at Buffalo Jones. Mrs. Michelle DiFiore has been in Garden City for quite a while at Buffalo Jones for seven. Um, and Julia Morales has been at Buffalo Jones for seven. Uh, the original three that presented are Rod Willis, who's going to be just sitting and listening to the presentation <laughs> this time around, uh, Mrs. Annette Segovia, and Don Briggs. And she is also here to observe the presentation. Uh, it is, again, an honor, and we are going to show you from the beginning uh, to the present, how Buffalo Jones has impacted student learning and also the district. And I will turn it over to my teachers. Where would you like us? Here, right there. Right there's mine? The poor school, the kids on the west side of town. The students who can't speak, read, or write in English. How do you work with those students? Those teachers might not be doing their jobs. Their response to my work at Buffalo Jones was, why are you still there? These stereotypes appear to be proven reality once the AYP results hit the press. This was a dismal year for Buffalo Jones. We were humiliated, full of despair. Uncertainty was felt. Would we lose our jobs? We had done what everyone had expected, but we did not make AYP. They're playing this game that we could have made. There are plenty of excuses we could have made. Our demographics, for example. 94% of our students are Hispanic, and many of them are first and second generation in our country. Um, college and career readiness, not tradition in their families. The second excuse that we could make is our socioeconomic status. Most of our students are living in poverty. Just in my class alone, over 50% of their parents are working night shift or double jobs just to make ends meet. That doesn't leave a lot of time for extracurricular activities or helping kids with homework. And finally, parent education. Almost 40% of our students' mothers have less than a high school education. Even if they wanted to help their children with homework, a lot of them don't have the skills to do that. Let's be honest, academic learning stops when most of our students leave our school. That's not really our school style to make excuses. Buffalo Jones, that's a new excuse. 
It was time to make a change. And in the beginning, there was reading first. 90 minute reading blocks. We were the first uh, school to use this and it is now a district wide initiative. Centers implemented in both math and reading to support differentiated, individualized learning. Guided reading, student groups, data-driven, and differentiated to meet each student's needs. Intense professional development before school, after school, and on weekends to strengthen instruction. Analyzing data, finding out exactly what the data means and how we could use it effectively. And research-based practice and materials. Let's be honest, it was, dif it was a difficult transition for our school. We had outsiders come in and tell us that our instruction was inadequate. We had to take a different approach. Our whole school schedule was revamped. We had our reading coach, who was a peer, a colleague, take on the seemingly authority figure role. Professional development occurred during the summer months and even some weekends. It was a long road, but we're there. But we were just getting started. Teacher of Lufau Jones, our equipment with professional development that allows them to incorporate these practices daily. Central Office has support us to have higher expectation for all stakeholders, staff, students, parents, community and administration. We needed to work all together to be able to succeed uh, our goal. Science. Developing content and language objective will help and allow students to understand and, and know where, what they're going to be learning and how they're going to be learning it. Higher thinking skill levels are part of our daily instruction. In order to reach uh, our goal, we needed to expand our student thinking by uh, reasoning, looking for uh, application, uh, analyzing, planning, evaluate, and even create something new. Differentiation is evident in our classroom. Not all students learn at the same pace. Not all students are the same level. So that's why uh, the teacher needs to know uh, and to know where are the weaknesses and where are the strengths so they can target, target that specific area. Rigor and relevance. Teachers plan to have rigorous and relevance. It goes together with higher thinking level. Uh, we have to connect them with the students' lives, uh, family lives, the world, so they can be able to relate it and connect it with the real life situation. Not only learn it just because we need to learn it. Writing, writing, and yes, more writing. Even in math, even in math, our teachers have high expectation for writing starting at kinder through fourth grade. By expanding their thinking, uh, we are a, they are able to explain their reasoning in writing, so that's very important. We made a drastic change in our intervention for our students and found that collaboration is key. Students are grouped by their individual needs. With collaboration, the benefits to the teachers are more open communication, working with your colleagues, and also getting to see and analyze the data. Our benefits for our students, they get that specific skill practice that they need. It's individualized for them and their needs. And also, they have that personal stakehold in watching their growth and their flourishment in their <coughs> academics. Data-driven instruction. Student achievement. Reader and relevance. Race writing strategy. Relationship building. Innovation.
we increased standardized test scores from 2003 to 2011 in math and reading from the 50th to the 80th percentile. We made AYP in math for A consecutive years. We made AYP in reading for seven years. Buffalo Jones won the Standard of Excellence Award for math in 2012. We saw a significant decrease in SPED referrals. Effective instruction in Tier 2 and Tier 3 resulted in a student exiting the intervention program. Our hard work was paying off. We will continue to flourish by continuing core practices in our school culture. Buffalo Jones ranked second in Ames Webb in the district for percentile growth from fall to winter with a 4.61 improvement in reading. Teachers also saw a rise in achievement as from 2010 to 2014, Buffalo Jones saw nine Crystal Apple semifinalists, five Crystal Apple finalists, and three Crystal Apple recipients. 17 Buffalo Jones teachers have pursued their master's degree. And again, regarding relevance, the teachers at Buffalo Jones think about their thinking. They make thinking visible and use reading strategy to instruct students in building their schema, inferencing, questioning, visualizing, and synthesizing, making this evident in the walkthrough walk data and later uh, reinforced at the PLC meetings. Race. Restate the question, answer the question, cite evidence, edit error. An opening implementation of race strategy in the classroom with frequent collaboration of highly expected, effective strategy as well as student sample being reviewed by teachers monthly. Another piece of the puzzle is developing the strategy their talents and shine outside of the classroom with our student clubs. There's something really incredible at the clubs at Buffalo Jones and it's not just that we have almost 75 percent participation by third and fourth grade students and it's not just that we have teachers volunteering their Fridays after school unpaid just to provide safe and fun activities for our students. The real magic is that we've found a way to break down the anti-school barrier that kids put up when school just really isn't their thing. And aren't those the kids that need us the most? We encourage team building through the use of cake instructors. Also, having a check-in and check-out process for our students who need more of that one-on-one -on -one time and encouragement. We, we have lunch with our students. Also, we award our students for their fast math efforts, and we recognize them at the end of the year ceremony along with watching their talents flourish and come alive at our end of the year talent show. And we can't forget our cute little ones at our kindergarten graduation. Buffalo Jones is leading the way in innovation. Buffalo Jones embraced the Reading First Grant and proceeded with the 90 minute reading blocks and math blocks, which later became a district wide initiative. Full day kindergarten was implemented during dual language run and later implemented in district wide. We are the only school to be using the SAP process or piloting the SAP process using the MTSS protocol. We recreated the intervention process. And we're currently the only school with a sustained native language track. Teacher expert. 
uh, parents were able to assist to a conference that was created with them in mind. Our talented teacher presented best practices, ideas for parents to work on with their children at home. We, uh, we uh, work with phonics, CGI math problems, math ELA curriculum, fact fluency, and a very important part, parent involvement. Last year, Buffalo Jones won the Healthy School Makeover Competition grant. That was $45,000 worth of programming, curriculum, and equipment to help make our staff, students, and community more health conscious. Part of that grant was that we had the opportunity to have a Skype interview with Annika Sorenstam, the world's best female golfer. And you can see here, it's a little picture of one of our students asking a question to her. These innovative opportunities have given our student access to role models and different activities that they would never before had had these opportunities to do. Uh, this is not only this is not only enhancing their education, it's also enhancing their life. Teachers this year competed in a bulletin board challenge to display uh, different types of student work. a long way. Here the data driven decision. A data is always used to make decision. As you can see here, uh, students are color coded by class and all relevant students data is included on each card with a student code for protect confidentiality. <laughs> day and age isn't a school with everything in place to be successful. Resources, money, extra support staff, dedicated administrators, and forward-thinking teachers. A model school is a school with pressure, with missing resources, with bad stigma, who rise above these obstacles and make their own success. Buffalo Jones has been leading our district towards becoming a model district so that schools who are struggling can look to us and know that there's hope. Buffalo Jones. Together, together we, we can, can, together, together we, we will. will. staff and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. So we hope that we make our district proud and uh, we're here to teach kids and we love what we do. Any questions? Questions? How about? There's plenty of people here <laughs> that can respond. You know, it's just amazing. I haven't seen this before and it's just amazing and, and laudable and exciting. Uh, I couldn't help but catch as you went along talking about the emphasis on reading. Just curious, knowing how we, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, we really put the pressure on, on the library set. To what extent does that factor in? Basically, the question is how do you implement reading? Is it, is it through books in the library or is it more um, programmed? I'd like to have the teacher say and say that because they're the ones that are doing that say that. Well, I think something that's really important to remember is that oh, the students at Buffalo Jones are living in poverty. And so they don't have access. It's a pretty far walk to the public library. So for many of them, those are the only books that they have access to. And even though their parents may not be home all the time to be able to help them with their homework, that is one thing that they can do, get books at their level to be able to practice their skills at home. And we really rely on that as a staff having our students have that practice at home and giving them skills to work on. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And another thing, our librarian has uh, incorporated small groups to, to make sure that they're understanding the connection with what's happening in the classroom and the connection with her library and the resources that she has. Yeah. Just a comment. Uh, being a person that attended Buffalo Jones School from first to sixth grade, 
very proud of your school. And thank you. I will. I did have the opportunity to hear your presentation the first time when you really uh, listened to all of the district's presentation for the model school conference. And I was moved then, and I was moved beyond that night. Uh, you guys are are fabulous, and I just I can't think of anything that you've missed and left out. I can't think of anything that I would allow you to take out of that program because everything is so important, which is exactly what we're talking about. It's a complicated, dynamic puzzle, and it, every one of those pieces are important. Um, something that you haven't um, mentioned, but I, I am aware of that we have had multiple eight scholars that have gone through our district that went to Buffalo Jones. Right? Do yes. you know the, yes. the data on that, like how many there were? I know at least three. Three. That's pretty impressive. I mean, those are really um, well-renowned uh, students, and you gave them the foundation to go fly, and that doesn't happen on accident. Um, they, two of them came from the, three, did all three of them come from the Sustained Native Language, and one valedictorian came from the Sustained Native Language program. That this, like, that's, a, like, that's a program I have not heard of. So <laughs> you're adding English as a second language, but you are, you're not asking them to give up their native language. You are encouraging bilingual education, correct? We did lots of research, and the best way to reach non-English speakers is through their native language, if you have the resources. Well, we, we had enough Spanish-speaking teachers that could accomplish that goal. And so we have one track. <laughs> Kindergarten, first and second, be instructed in Spanish. Second grade, they begin the transition. And by the time they reach third grade, they're in an all English setting. So they're, they're learning the language, but the academics is taught in their native language. And that just, the, the transition is kind of a natural process. It's, it's almost hard to, to explain, but the teachers do a beautiful job of, of making the adjustments that they need to, and we've made adjustments. Uh, you know, when we talk about innovating and trying different things, uh, thanks to Dr. Atha and the board and, and our administrators here in the central office, they've supported the different research data that we've brought to them and implemented some things, and we now feel that we have the best program for our kids at this time. We transition in second grade because by the time they're in third grade, they have to take the uh, state assessment. and so. Our kids are, when we look at the data in that third grade setting, you really cannot tell the difference because our kids are meeting uh, the expectations even in third grade. I just wanted to say I've had two children at, at Buffalo Jones at various times and we have a very welcoming school. I think um, the community feels that as well and, and that's part of why the students are successful your staff is also wonderful too. Every single person I ever encountered there was just very helpful and, and pleasant and very wonderful with the children. And I, I think a lot of that is due to the way that you, you manage that school and created that school. So I'd like to thank you, Mrs. Sims. Thank you. And what a great example you set when your educators, your co-workers are working to further your own education with 17 plus teachers going for their masters or in the process or they already have it. That is important and the students know that, right? You share that experience with them. You let them know that you're leaving class, going to class. Exactly. <laughs> We're learning our whole lives. It doesn't just, like you said, it doesn't stop because we go home at night or we go to the next grade. I mean, we're, we're lifelong learners and I, you really do set that foundation for the kiddos. I want to thank you all. I was hugely impressive. And the job you're doing it, it, for the district is awesome. Thank you very much.
favor, please raise your hand. Next two uh, agenda items have to do with Garden City High School, and uh, we're going to hear uh, from them in reference to the iPad initiative and where we are and kind of update you on that. Followed up with the Senate Foundation's support for the ADD program at Garden City High School. I believe Deb Garner and Mr. Krause will double check. said we we want to get the focus off the logistics we've talked to you lots and lots about the logistics this is going to be a little snapshot of that but then we're going to move to that curriculum and instruction good evening uh, we're closing in on our second full year of our initiative uh, before we begin I want to thank these two Casey and Laney um, they have put their heart and soul in this and it is um, like you said it's been, it's been a technology initiative and it's been successful because of these two. We have gone and talked to many other districts that are using iPads in their high schools, similar to ours. Our costs are less, our breakage is less, our procedures we feel are better. And from a technology standpoint, we think we're, we're excelling. Um, a couple highlights that I want to point out. First, we were able to purchase iPads for next year at a discounted rate, um, saving the district approximately $30,000. Recall we reduced the fee for insurance last year from $40 on our first year to $30 this year. And even with those reduced amounts, we are able to um, fix all of our breakage. We're a self-insured district, and we're staying well within our budget there. Um, we purchased some license, licenses to allow our teachers more freedom in the classrooms, and Casey and Laney will tell you about that in a little bit. In April, you approved the purchase of 400 iPads, and those are leased iPads. Um, recall we had but seniors last year we leased for one year, the seniors, juniors last year, two years. We purchased those iPads, and so far um, we've had about 100 seniors who have replied that have registered to purchase their iPads. And these are the iPads they've been using since last year. So that leaves us at this point, and they have until Friday um, to purchase or to pay for and to register uh, graduates can for their iPads. That, if no more. Uh, apply for that, that leaves us about 300, and now we can start moving these iPads into other grades. Um, lastly, through a program with Verizon, uh, they have given us four Wi Fi devices, and those devices we have sent on some of our activity buses for our high school students. And this is allowing those kids that have spent hours um, on any given day to participate somewhere across the state to do homework on the bus. Uh, we're piloting it with swim team, with softball and with um, golf and so far it's been highly successful it, um, each Wi-Fi device is costing us about forty dollars a month and, and for unlimited data which is unheard of as you know um, but because we're an educational institution they're giving us unlimited data um, so we are looking at approaching our um, clubs to help pay for that we can turn those off and on so we'll turn them off over the summer so we don't incur any costs um, so we're just a little plug, we're looking for donations for that. And and those charges are e-rateable. We'll put that on the e-rate next year as well. That will cover a lot of those costs. I can't even get out of the parking lot without the girls telling me to turn them on. So they, they want them on right away. So it's working very well. Having having one, having two on our list. So. Um, we're going to okay. talk about... Oh, go ahead, Tom. Sure. Uh, because I want to... Say, this ties in really well to our kids that go to college uh, because my daughter playing college softball, talking to the AD across the sports, he said, when you get on the bus at college, you'd be surprised. Those kids are doing their homework. Now, most of them are using their smartphones or whatever. So this 
helps get that focus for our kids that when you take that next step, you're you know, they're just that much more ready. Right. Now this was a great time to pilot. Spring sports are out a lot at this time of year, and they're gone all day, and they get really behind. And this is a way we can really help our kiddos, and it has been so well received. I have a daughter on the swim bus, I have a son on the golf bus, and they are now getting those assignments done. We don't have all those missing assignments. We try, you know, for swimming, and I think the other coaches do it as well, we track their grades every week. So it's, it gives me an opportunity. We're going to be gone twice this week and have no excuse not to be getting that stuff done. We don't have that built-in excuse of, well, I was gone all day and I couldn't do anything, so I'll worry about that tomorrow. You know, we're very proactive in telling our girls to get it done before we leave and, and get that taken care of. So it's, it's been great. Um, we have some changes coming for next year. A couple of them Casey and I are very excited about because it will make our lives easier, but moreover, it, it will make the management distribution and watching of our financial resources better. So the first thing we'll talk about is the device enrollment program called DEP. It's an entirely new thing Apple has come out with. It's totally free. But Apple finally stepped up to the plate and realized we really have to build something better to accommodate schools. We will pull in every iPad. They will be wiped. That's the downside. We provide our students cloud storage. There's the upside they can put anything we will put them all in the new system. Uh, they automatically then get enrolled on our management piece. We can wirelessly distribute apps to students. And when they're done, we can pull them back in and reuse them so we don't lose any apps. We get to reuse, and so we save money on that piece. Um, probably the best part is that if an iPad is stolen and, it, and, it's, and it's reset, it will always come to our login screen, and they can never, ever get out of it. The iPad talks to the Apple <coughs> server every time you get on it, and the Apple server will now say, okay, that device belongs to Garden City. That person has to put their credentials in. No credentials in, that iPad will never go off that screen, and so it turns into a brick, uh, and then we'll be able to, to manage that piece a little bit better. That will also that will also that piece will also be retroactive for any device that's maybe disappeared from our inventory over the past two years. So <laughs> if, it, if anybody's bought one of those, they will. Be it will happen in way. about a month. So in case you will have that up and running, so we'll be able to yeah. make a little progress there. The other piece that will benefit our our administration just kind of managing the devices and keeping kids. Right now, you know, if we have disciplinary issues. Principals are locking them down and those kinds of things. And we have some kids who decided they could wipe their device for the weekend, have their way with it, come back the next week and go, okay, wait a minute, something happened to my device over the weekend, and I need you to set it back up for me. This will now, when they wipe it, they're going to be asked for their credentials, and it's going to reply all the things that, that they're supposed to be on. So uh, we've had that happen. Uh, it's getting less and less as we deal with them more uh, in the disciplinary realm from the principal side. but. Uh, we still have kids who seem to think that they can kind of bypass that a little bit over the weekend when we're not monitoring them, so, or when they think we're not monitoring them. But, um, so that's, those are two probably the biggest pieces of that. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes pieces of that that you don't need to worry about it probably, but uh, it will help but us. But you can come help us if yeah. you want to redo all the five this summer. Only about 2,000 plus of them we're going to do. Yeah. Everything that's been bought so far. So. Well, um, did you say free babysitting? <laughs> uh, no, no, I think it's kind of what I understood. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm not babysitting you, Alex. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we can send our kids and you can babysit. I know, them. I know. They know more about technology than you. Know you, know what what you do. Do. Oh, okay. We are going to make a few policy changes. Um, just some odds and ends that have come up over the last, you know, we're learning every single year uh, things that we need to adapt to. After talking about Roxy said, we talked to law school districts about different things they do. We're pretty comfortable with how we have our iPads being managed, the agreement the kids have signed to, or are signed, uh, saying they would follow. Uh, but what we wanted to make sure we did is with our lost slash damaged iPads, um, we're going to put a little teeth behind that. You know, We've talked about it as an admin team when we meet, um, that our kids are, now that they've had them a couple years, some of them are becoming more lax with that device. They're not as concerned about it. If they may go two or four days before they tell me that it's lost, and now it makes it much more difficult to find it. Um, so we're going to put a little teeth behind that about um, requiring them to turn 
turn that in as lost or stolen within 24 hours, or we're going to start charging them an exponential fee for that uh, for that device. Because if they if they lose it, we want them.